All right, let's get started because uh, I think the there's a couple of like in class work things to do, and I think they're going to take a while. So, um, all right, so probably going to do a syllabus update soon. Um, I started I'm trying to rearrange a couple of things because we're not quite as far along as I wanted to be. So I'll just shift some things. Sound good? Okay. Um, all right, but. Today, uh, first thing I want to talk about is requirements gather. Um, it is exactly what it sounds like. It is when you go out and gather requirements. Um, however, the reason I use the word gathering is kind of important rather than like, well, so gathering, another word that's common is elicitation, uh, which does anyone know what elicitation means? How many word nerds are in here? Um, so um, elicitation means so like extract, right? except in a, it's like a positive version of the word extract. Um, so the reason I mentioned requirements gathering and elicitation or whatever is because it's important when you're doing requirements gathering that you not put something in their mouth, right? And, they, and that you also, from your client or whatever, that they don't tell you the solution, okay? So it's really important to try to figure out what are you trying to accomplish? Like, what's the goal? And then let the expert namely you, to later on determine what that solution should be. Um, and so this can be really difficult to do. Um, you know, it kind of, you know, I jokingly go to, uh, you know, when I try to negotiate where to have lunch with somebody, right? And you start off with, you know, uh, somebody will start asking questions and then you can never decide and go back and forth. Um, but so, if you start to think about like, okay, well, do you want Mexican food or do you want, you know, Chinese food or something like that? You know, you can start to uh, maybe get down that path. I don't know that, that example kind of broke while I was in the middle of trying to explain it, but whatever, long story short, when you're talking to people, um, it's really, really important. And I know I've always had a problem with this is that you have to listen and you also have to not go to a solution immediately. So that's kind of broad stroke on requirements gathering. Um, a few things that are, these are kind of specific to machine learning. Um, and, you know, it, it's a much wider subject when you talk about general software engineering, but we, I thought we'd talk about some, basically the differences when you talk about kind of machine learning requirements gathering or data science requirements gathering rather than uh, general software engineering. So the first thing is it's almost always a good idea, both in machine learning or, or data science and in software engineering to come up with some kind of problem statement. Okay. So, what is the overall goal? And um, we may have talked about that in here a little bit, but basically the idea with problem statement is it should be something kind of lofty, you know? It should be like, you know, what, what is the whole thing gonna do? Not any given feature, okay? So, so it's like, what is, why are we here uh, kind of problem statement, all right? And uh, yeah, so the first thing that often comes up um, and uh, is kind of fun uh, because I think one of the things when you're doing requirements gathering of any kind is that you're often trying to look, you're trying to like put yourself out of a job. Uh, so the first question is, what's wrong with doing this manually? Like, why do you need, you know, something like data science or machine learning or whatever to solve this problem? Okay, so obviously you have to know what the problem is first, but then the next question is, what's wrong with doing it manually? Um, and good answers to that are, it takes too long. It's very error prone. We're worried about uh, someone potentially like leaving the company and taking that all that knowledge with them. So these are some good reasons, um, but a lot of there's also a lot of bad reasons that are mostly about um, magic will happen. Okay, so that's usually a bad reason if they're just hoping that doing it this way will will do magic. Okay, um, sometimes it does, but that's not usually a good a good position to start off. From. All right, so who here knows what the acronym SME stands for, or generally pronounced SME? All right, so uh, you see this a ton in consulting. You don't see it in general organizations as much, um, but it's a, it's a subject matter expert, okay? And so this is just the person who usually is the person you're like kind of communicating with the most at say a client or, or on a project or whatever who really knows the problem space well, okay? So they're a subject matter expert. So one of the projects is like anomaly detection. They'll know what, what does anomaly mean, 
right in this in this domain right like what is something that's not usual uh so that would be a good example um you know uh and so like if you talk about like the prisons example uh, you know what what is you know uh, they're going to know everything there is to know about the people they're talking about okay uh or they they should or sometimes as me it'll actually be a collection of people and that's actually what led to why you're doing this work is that you have three or four people who know various parts of the domain but what you're trying to do with your software is actually bring those those domains together or bring the domain together um does this make sense all right everyone seems very sleepy today so uh all right um so basically one of the questions to ask this me is do they have a good sense or do they have a sense of what the outcome will be okay so what are they kind of expecting anomaly detection i think is really easy to talk about so i'll probably use that as an example a lot but are they expecting two percent to be discovered as anomalies are they expecting 80 percent okay getting an idea of what they kind of their gut tells them may inform your solution okay um and, and actually, I will even say it often informs your solution. It is occasionally true when that they're just flat wrong, okay? But that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad to, to know what they think the answer is, okay? So you do have to be a little careful of it because, like I said, they can be completely wrong. Um, all right, another one that is hard, hard, hard to figure out is what assumptions are being made, okay? So, um, you know, like I said, I keep using anomaly detection because I think it's easy to talk about. Um, but an assumption is what is an anomaly, right? So yes, they're a problem, you know, or a domain expert, but they're making an assumption about what they mean by an anomaly. So kind of understanding that along with, you know, that sense of the outcome and that kind of stuff will give you a, a better, stronger hint about how to approach the software. Um, all right, and then the next one is kind of, what's the definition of success? How do we know if we accomplished our goal, right? And this is a really good thing to outline up front um, because then you know when you're done, okay? Or you know when you're, you've reached essentially a checkpoint, right? Or a milestone, and you can then move on to other things, you know, so you may not be done with all the work, but you know when you feel like this portion of the problem has been solved, whatever it is. Um, and then a way of kind of, thinking about the results, okay? It's kind of like the definition of success, but slightly different, which is to think about uh, when, when this you know, model spits out answers, what is that gonna do, okay? Like, why does anybody want the answers, okay? And so uh, traditionally those are called, and you'll hear these terms used kind of interchangeably, although technically they are actually different, they just accomplish the same goal. So, Traditionally, people used to use what are called use cases, which is like, what is the user going to do with this information? Okay. A user story is very similar, except much more prescribed in that you always write them in this way. Okay. And so here's another word you may not know, which is a persona, which is a, kind of like a manufactured person. Sometimes, when you're, especially if you're working in an organization and most of what you work on is like one big application, which is not uncommon it can be really useful actually to develop like personas for each of the user roles that use the application and when i say a persona I mean, they'll be elaborate right they'll have names they'll have a picture they'll have like a backstory you know sometimes you'll get joking into it and be like you know oh yeah this one's married they have three kids you know and that one over there is recently divorced you know like you can get really elaborate about it but having some elaborateness to it especially a name allows people to short circuit a bunch of information okay so if i have a persona that's a system administrator um and we're going to call that system administrator bob then if i say bob you all know exactly who i mean okay as well as if you're not sure you can actually go look up the document that describes that persona does that make sense so it, it solves some of that and i think i've mentioned this here before right Solves some of that communication gap of just talking to other humans tends to be lossy. Um, and so if you write it down, you can kind of all agree on what is this persona. But so when you do a user story, you say, ask this person type, I want something, some piece of data, you know, um, I want to see an anomaly, right? So that I can go and hunt down a fix for it. 
Okay, so you need both halves, and use cases usually only have the first half, or kind of this, uh, like the persona and the, the kind of want, and they're usually missing the so that. And it's important because, again, the misinterpretation problems. Okay, so that's why we use this format. Um, it's just, you know, makes it easier, that kind of thing. Um, all right, so the next thing is who should be able to access the, the data that's going into your you know, engine, whatever that means, um, and who should be able to access the results. This is basically where you get into questions of confidentiality, okay? And this will often be defined by role, right? So, you know, um, your common, you know, person in the company may not be able to access the results. Um, actually, they probably are more likely not to be able to access the data, but can access the results, right? Because a lot of the secret stuff sits in the data and then the result kind of gets rid of the secret stuff. Um, from a software engineering perspective, uh, like I, I love this example where, um, do y'all know uh, who Fidelity is, the company? All right, so Fidelity, you know, manages almost, like it feels like everyone's uh, kind of retirement accounts, um, but they have an interesting rule with their customer service reps in that the same user can't update the, um, the address of a payment to be made and the fact that it will be made. Okay, so I can't go in and change it to my home address and then say, send the letter or send the check, right? Um, and it's just kind of a neat thing, right? Where it's kind of in this vein where, you know, if you think about how can you separate what users can do or you know, have access to, you can affect what they're able to do, you know, maliciously in particular, but even by accident, right? Um, and then explicitly what's out of scope. So um, so did I talk about scope? So scope is basically like, what's the problem domain? So it's kind of the problem statement, okay? It's the, the size of the thing, what's inside it is usually referred to as scope, okay? Um, and then out of scope is things that are not in that domain, you know, in that bucket. Um, sometimes it'll like, you know, if you imagine it as like a circle, right? Sometimes with the scope, there will be like a chunk in the middle of the circle that you don't want to go near, like the SMEs or the, you know, whoever is doing the client or whatever, they know there's a lot of messiness there or it's problematic or it's got confidentiality problems or whatever. So they'll explicitly like pull a hole out of the circle and say, nope, that's out of scope for sure. Okay. But then it'll also be stuff that's just outside the edges. Uh, so that's why you want to know there may or may not be anything that is explicitly out of scope, but that's kind of the idea is that. Um, you just kind of ask to say, you know, is there anything we should be aware of that is explicitly not in scope for this one? All right, so like I said, I just wanted to give you kind of a brief overview. You should be meeting your clients soon if you haven't already. And so this is the first thing you're gonna be kind of doing with them. Uh, so I thought it'd be a good idea to talk about how you can help to talk to them and maybe get some, you know, better answers than otherwise. Questions? Okay. Um, this is, uh, maybe I'll try to find you a good reading, but it's kind of all over the internet. It can be worthwhile, especially if you don't uh, take in, you know, like a lecture very well from an understanding perspective. You know, just go Google a couple of like requirements gathering articles and uh, you, it, it really can help. Uh, at least it does for me because I am much more, like I learn things by reading them. I don't learn things very well out loud, essentially. Uh, so. If you have an opportunity before your first client meeting, it might be a good idea. All right. So, given our discussion last time, um, and I thought you would have kind of more experience with this, uh, I decided to, as an exercise, have you actually build your own exploratory data analysis template. Uh, so it's now in grade scope. It should be live. Um, I want you to team up with your teammate for the project. Um, and if they aren't here, I apologize, but that's the way it is. Um, and it's a team assignment, so you only need to submit one. Uh, so you should work on it together. Um, and as it, it kind of instructs you in uh, the grade scope, it says, you know, use Google Colab. Um, if you don't want to use that, use something else. It's up to you. Um, but basically I'll let you kind of look at it and read it. Um, we're gonna do this for 
whatever remaining time we have left, we have about an hour. So call it half an hour we're gonna work on this. And then I have another little exercise project that I wanna work on uh, after that. So the idea of this, why we're doing it in lecture is if you have questions or you want ideas or whatever, uh, Shu and I are here to help. That make sense? All right. Uh, did I have any seriously confusing sentences in the grade scope? Which is always possible. <laughs> <laughs>